Welcome, everyone. This is great to see such a robust crowd gathered, uh, such as it is, uh, for this program this evening. Um, on behalf of the Center for International and Area Studies at Northwestern, I want to thank the Evanston Public Library and Lorena Neal in particular for partnering with us on this event. As many of you know, um, the Evanston Public Library has been partnering with the Middle East and North African Studies program at Northwestern for several years, and I've been privileged to be part of that partnership. Um, and now that the Middle East and North African Studies program is part of this larger unit at Northwestern called the Center for International and Area Studies, um, we are continuing and in fact expanding our partnership with the Evanston Public Library on events like this. And I also want to note that there are two other co-sponsors for this evening's program, two other uh, units at Northwestern, the Program of African Studies and the Chabraya Center for Historical Studies, appropriately enough, when you uh, hear uh, a little bit more about our speaker, Peter Cole, you'll understand the significance of this kind of ensemble of centers and units at Northwestern uh, who have collaborated on this evening's event. Peter is professor of history at Western Illinois University. He's also a research associate in the Society Work and Development Institute, SWAP, at the University of Witwatersrand. Whoops, I think I'm going to badly mangle this. Uh, Peter, can you correct me? Is it Witwatersrand? It's Vatersrand. Um, you can also just say Witz. W is a Witz. V. That's right, Witz. Um, so the University of witz in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, Peter is the founder and co-director of the Chicago Race Riot of 1919 Commemoration Project, a year-long initiative in 2019 to heighten the 1919 Chicago race riots in the city's collective memory which engaged Chicagoans in public conversations about the legacy of the most violent week in Chicago history. Peter has written for a range of publications, including Time Magazine, the Washington Post's Made by History blog, The Conversation, The Mail and Guardian in Johannesburg, once again, In These Times, Jacobin, and several other outlets. And Peter has several books to name including Wobblies on the Waterfront, Interracial Unionism in Progressive Era Philadelphia, which was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2007. He co-edited the volume Wobblies of the World, A Global History of the IWW, published by Pluto Press in 2017. Peter is also one, one of the editors of a Pluto Press book series on global labor politics called Wildcat. The other editors of that series are based in the US, the UK, and South Africa. So it's very much a transnational intellectual publishing venture. Uh, again, that's called Wildcat. You should look that up on the Pluto Press website and check out some of the titles in that series. But the book that we are gathered uh, this evening to hear Peter discuss of course, as you know, is Dock Worker Power, Race and Activism in Durban and the San Francisco Bay Area, also published by the University of Illinois Press in late 2018, so really a year and a half ago. Uh, this book is an award-winning book. It won the Philip Taft Labor History Book Award from the Labor and Working Class History Association, known as Laucha and Cornell University's ILR, Industrial and Labor Relations School. Uh, the critical reception of this book has really been uh, something. Ross, well, I'll just give you a small flavor of the reception of Peter's most recent book. Ross Webb, writing in Reviews in History, calls Dock Worker Power a sweeping panoramic narrative. Marcus Redeker, author of The Slave Ship, A Human History, says Peter Cole has written a cutting edge work that combines labor, maritime, comparative, and global history in brilliantly illuminating ways. And Keisha Blaine, writing in Black Perspectives, comments, the fascinating stories that Peter Cole centers in Dock Worker Power 
capture the dynamics of global social movements, the significance of black internationalism, and the power of grassroots organizing. So what a time, um, what a timely juncture to host uh, this discussion about a book that deals with this intersection of issues, labor, race, internationalism, solidarity, grassroots organizing um, from a historical, uh, global, and comparative historical perspective. Um, one final note is that for those of you who, had, who have attended some of our previous events at the Evanston Public Library, you know that when you walk in, you would normally see uh, in the community room on the first floor, uh, as you're finding your seat, you would see a table uh, stacked with books. And uh, in this case, copies of Peter's book. And that uh, table would be, uh, um, would be hosted by Bookends and Beginnings, a fantastic bookshop in Evanston with whom we partner on many of our events for books, uh, um, uh, re books that have come out in the recent past when we're doing an author event. So unfortunately, that is one thing. I think there are a lot of cool things about doing these events via Zoom. For example, we can include people who don't live in Evanston or Chicago or the Chicago area. We, can, we have people who have Zoomed in from all over the country and indeed beyond. And I love that fact about um, our present uh, situation. But the one thing that's missing is you can't grab a copy of Peter's book in hand. Some of you may already have it, but I just want to put in a plug for our other partner, um, our invisible partner this evening, Bookends and Beginnings. Of course, you should buy uh, a copy of Peter's book uh, at your favorite uh, bookseller, wherever that may be, whichever, on, whichever place you're buying books online these days. But I want to put in a special plug for Bookends and Beginnings because they have been such a longstanding partner of ours. So with that said, I want to hand things over to Peter for this discussion and get your questions ready. Um, you, you don't have to hold your questions till the end. As Lorena mentioned, you can put them in the chat while the discussion is going and Lorena will log them. Peter, thanks for joining us this evening. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for um, coming, if you will, uh, to this virtual event. Um, thanks to Danny for organizing this in Northwestern. Thanks to Lorena and the folks at Evanston Public Library. And of course, thanks to all of you who have chosen to spend a little time watching and or listening to me. I see or see the names of friends and family among you. I see Franklin, I see Daniel, I see Philip, I see Royce, I see Kim. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but like anyway, like uh, awesome. Thank you so much, right? Like, uh, so let's see if I can do this now. Um, I'm going to... Um, share my screen, enter full screen. We plan this and then you never know what's going to happen. Hey, uh, start share. All right. Well, um, I can't see any of you, but you can see my screen, and um, hopefully that's good enough. Um, thank you again so much for your participation, attendance, and attention, even if it's only partial. Feel free to text all your friends while I'm talking. So my book is called Doc Worker Power. Um, it was my wonderful girlfriend who helped me come up with that title, actually. Um, and um, there's basically three major subjects um, that my book explores. I'll explain them all a bit more. Um, but I'm going to focus really on, on number one and number three because they're most appropriate for this week and this moment. Um, the fight for black equality in one's own city, in one's own country, as well as really the fight for the same issues, equality, justice, um, liberation, right, worldwide, right? Um, and believe it or not, dock workers in San Francisco, Bay Area, and Durban have been fighting um, alongside many of us for um, the better part of 100 years for these um, really um, timely, but also timeless matters. Um, so um, I don't plan to talk much about the uh, comparative history, these sort of notion that, um, you know, why do you sort of compare two different societies, the United States and South Africa? 
for those of us who know these places, it's sort of obvious. But for many of us who are unfamiliar with maybe South Africa, but who live here in the United States, I'm just going to read you one quote from Robert F. Kennedy, pictured in these two photographs, um, uh, when he visited South Africa for one week in 1966. Um, and when he was at the University of Cape Town, um, he said, among other things, the following, quote, I came here because of my deep interest and affection for a land settled by the Dutch in the mid 17th century, then taken over by the British and at last independent, a land in which the native inhabitants were at first subdued, but relations with whom remain a problem to this day, a land which defined itself on a hostile frontier, a land which has tamed rich natural resources through the energetic application of modern technology a land which once imported slaves and now must struggle to wipe out the last traces of that former bondage, I refer, of course, to the United States of America. Now, if we were all in the same room, you might laugh, and I might actually get a cue from that, that you got the parallel, because Kennedy was in South Africa, he was talking about South Africa, and he was talking about the United States of America, because, in fact, these two countries share a tremendous amount in common, going back literally 500 years or so. Um, and if anyone wants to talk further about the sort of this notion that we might compare the history of the United States and the present, for that matter, to another place, but specifically South Africa, well, of course, I'm happy to do that um, in the conversation component. So let me tell you a little about the two places that I'm going to talk to you about and that I wrote about in my book, Doc Worker Power. Um, the first place is called Durban. Um, it's the largest city um, in South Africa on the east coast of South Africa. The east coast is the Indian Ocean. And, you know, thankfully, there's a big red arrow pointing us roughly to where the city of Durban is located. Um, it was first colonized as far as Europeans by uh, the English in the early 1800s. Um, who also named the province, um, now it's called the state uh, Natal, now it's called KwaZulu Natal. Um, and Durban is the photograph on the right, that's really a wonderful aerial photograph. So we're looking from east to west, yeah, um, with the Africa, sort of the southeast corner of a Africa in, 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 in the photograph. And then you see a very, very narrow mouth into the harbor um, between those two peninsulas, right, to the right-hand side, which is north, that's called the point. Right, um, and on the ocean, uh, away from the ocean on the harbor side, that was called the point. And that's where essentially um, the harbor was, um, all the work. And then the city sort of um, lays out beyond it um, to the left. And actually the entire um, frame is the city of Durban. Um, and then I won't talk about it much, but uh, once containerization happened in the 1970s and 80s, all the work in the harbor really moved to the south coast of the harbor, which is to the left-hand side of this photograph, right? Um, although it wouldn't be in this image, right? Um, and anyway, so that's Durban. Um, Durban, by the early 20th century, is the busiest port in South Africa. South Africa is the largest economy in, on the continent of Africa. And uh, Durban is the busiest port pretty much in all of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, although there's a port now in um, modern day Tunisia, right? Like uh, that's sort of a busy container port. But basically Durban is um, the, the most important port in Africa, arguably, and one of the largest in the Southern hemisphere. Now, San Francisco, a place probably more familiar to most of us, right? Um, uh, you know, you've got essentially a narrow mouth, although much wider than uh, Durban Harbor, right? Into San Francisco Bay. Um, and then it opens up into this huge bay, right? And all the work historically was on the eastern side of the city of San Francisco, which is the peninsula, the south peninsula of the San Francisco Bay. Um, and then with containerization in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, um, all the work really moves to the so-called East Bay, um, which is where Oakland and um, Berkeley and Alameda and other places are, right? Um, the photograph is actually from 1850 San Francisco, um, and it sort of gives us a, a sense of the flavor of early San Francisco. Although Los Angeles will surpass San Francisco in population in the early 20th century, um, and in many other ways beyond that, um, San Francisco and Oakland will be actually more important as ports until the 1970s, although in recent decades, the Port of LA Long Beach is far larger and more important um, for a bunch of reasons, but one of the most simple is that it's actually closer to China. 
So I'm interested in ports and port cities, like, like Durban and San Francisco, but we need not only think about these places. You might know Hamburg in Germany, the biggest port in Germany. You might know Valparaiso, the biggest port on the west coast of South America, the Pacific coast in Chile. You might know Shanghai, um, to be Shanghai, right? Um, uh, all of these are port cities. And I'm highlighting in particular that um, port cities share much in common with each other, but you have to appreciate that these ports are central to the economies, not only of the local places and the states and provinces, but also actually to the national economy, right? And that literally global trade is really what makes our essentially economy work at the national and global level, right? Um, and so therefore the people in these places really define themselves by their relationship to the sea, perhaps even more so than the relationship to their fellow uh, people in their own countries, right? In other words, someone who lives in San Francisco might have some more in common with someone in Sydney in Australia than someone, say, in Kansas City in Missouri, right? Um, and also that these places, port cities, are where ideas and people come together and are exchanged. Now, we also have, of course, the exchange of goods and services, i.e. economic exchange or trade, but I'm highlighting that that's not the only thing or even the most important thing about cities. It's where people come together, right? People from different places um, who have different ideas and knowledge about other parts of the world. Now that doesn't mean to say that always, they always get along, far from it. But it actually often means that people who are familiar with those who are different, both in terms of ethnicity, in terms of religion, in terms of ideas, are often more open-minded. Not guaranteed, but it's not coincidence, for instance, that San Francisco is in fact one of the most open-minded progressive places in the country. If you don't know that that's because of the port, you actually don't know San Francisco. By the same token, if we're thinking about Hamburg, a place I've spent some time in recent years, why did the Beatles play in Hamburg? And guess where they played? They actually played in the equivalent of San Francisco's North Beach, right? Um, in a neighborhood called St. Pauli's, which is still the cultural um, cat heart, if you will, of Hamburg, right? Um, now I have a quote here from uh, the, the, the late mayor of uh, the city of Gdansk in Northern Poland, who was murdered um, because he was so open-minded, because he was anti-fascist, because he was anti-homophobic, and because he was anti-xenophobic. And I appreciated when I read an obituary about that man, murdered actually about 15 months ago, um, that he identified him and his place, Gdansk, as a port city, and that that actually helps understand um, his ideas, as well as many others who are um, less well-known, right? Um, so um, let me tell you a little bit more about shipping before we talk about these places. Um, shipping basically is the first industry of capitalism, right? Um, it is also simultaneously uh, shipping is the way that Europe conquered the world in the 15th century, 16th and 17th century. In, in other words, um, capitalism as an economic system and imperialism as a political system rise together on the sailing ship, right? And in the 18th century, London, England was the largest city in the world. Um, I should say the most important city in the world, um, the busiest city in the world, the biggest port in the world. It's also not coincidentally where we get the word strike from. Now, um, for those of us who know sailing, you know that to take down the sails of your ship is to strike your sails. Um, however, you may not know that in 1768 in London, England, when sailors wanted to get a raise, they stopped work. And to stop work, they took down their sails. And that, in other words, came to be the de facto word that we all use in the English language for work stoppages, whether they happen on the waterfront or whether they happen in a steel factory, right? Um, that also tells us a little about the centrality of the maritime world for our economic system. Um, now, let me just tell you briefly, if only too briefly, about those who work on the waterfront. Uh, they're called dock workers, they're called longshore workers, you can call them various other terms. Um, the system is called casual because a dock worker doesn't have a guaranteed job from week to week or year to year. Um, or even from day to day. Instead, they have to report for work in the hopes that they will be hired for a job traditionally. This was called casual labor. Sometimes nowadays it's also called precarious labor, right? And in many American cities, if you've ever seen famously the movie On the Waterfront, there's a scene of the shape up where basically workers are pitted against each other um, by the bosses, um, which has the effect of driving down labor costs because you will work for less if you are desperate for a job. Um, it also results in you seeing your fellow workers as the enemy instead of your friends, 
Um, if you get hired for a job, well, the work is very hard. You might have to lift and load hundreds of pounds of sacks um, in the pre-container era. Um, you have to do this up and down um, in ships that are moving. You have to do it in day and night, in good weather and bad, if it's raining or if it's snowing. Um, you might have to do it for 24 or even 36 hours because the ship must sail on time. And even though this work is hard and dangerous, um, it also gets paid very badly. Right. Um, that would be the nature of dock work, whether we're talking about China or whether we're talking about Chile. Yeah. Um, however, importantly, the work itself actually instills a collective identity, and that's crucial to understand. Um, so we can't load a ship by ourselves. Right. You need to work together. You often work in pairs and then you work in gangs. Right. And it, traditionally, it could take 100 or more workers. And I should note that before the 1970s and 80s, almost all these workers were men, right? Um, and so workers would have to work together. There's also a clear divide between the bosses and the workers, um, developing an us versus them mentality. Another way to think about this is that we're seeing the development of class consciousness, right? Um, now, another important component of this industry is because of that feature of time. Again, the ship must sail on time, or another well-known saying, time is money. Um, according to Lou Goldblatt, a great leader in the ILWU, the shipping industry has a feature that should never be underestimated. The economic power of the longshoremen is fantastic compared to most workers, the amount of leverage they have. Everyone understood this. The bosses understood it, but so did the workers. And that gave them the potential, i.e. the threat to stop work, i.e. strike. And that gives them the potential power to do all sorts of things to their benefit. What might they do? Now, workers might do their, use their collective power to do things like get a raise, to reduce their amount of hours that they have to work, to maybe have a safer workplace. All of those goals are, in my opinion, very worth fighting for. However, I am gonna highlight, and my book highlights, really, the other things that unions can do on behalf of a group of people and a society and a world. And so I'm gonna highlight two themes today, two of my three themes. One is that dock workers in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also in Durban have historically, and to this moment, have fought for black equality. Now, why is that? So this takes us back to the 1930s, right? In 1930s America and around the world, there was a so-called Great Depression, right? Um, and despite the tremendous economic suffering of tens of millions of Americans and people beyond the United States, um, workers were increasingly militant in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, in 1934, in San Francisco, then the biggest city in, in, on the West Coast and the biggest port city, and on every other port across the coast, up and down, um, in the summer of 1934, dock workers went on strike, what was nicknamed and still called the so-called Big Strike, right? led by a man who came out of the rank and file named Harry Bridges, pictured here and nicknamed the notes, right? Um, this big strike ended up shutting down the entire West Coast for six weeks in the summer of 34. And in the aftermath of that, a union was born. And by 1937, it became known as the International Longshore Men's and Warehouse Men U Union, AKA the ILWU. And um, with Bridges in the lead for the next really 40 years, the ILWU became incredibly powerful. And so sometimes it's referred to as going from war frats, i.e. weak workers, to lords of the docks. Um, actually, the best paying blue collar workers um, really in America. Um, not only did these dock workers fight to improve their own wages and conditions, they also operationalized a, a host of radical ideas. This is crucial to my book, but also to the story I'm trying to tell. Harry Bridges and many other members of the LWU in the Bay Area, but also in many other ports, were radical. They weren't just radical as in, I want to raise my rate um, earnings. They also were socialists. Some were communists, some were Trotskyists, some were members of the industrial workers of the world, some were anarchists, some were you might call independent leftists, but many of the members of the LWU believed in socialism and they wanted to turn their union into a socialist community. How did they do that? Well, first of all, they got rid of the shape up because the shape up is the boss's way to divide and weaken workers. Instead, now the bosses have to call up the union and say, tomorrow we want 100 guys to come down to Pier 20 to load coffee beans or unload coffee, right? Um, how do, um, so the union gets rid of the uh, shape up, number one. Number two, the union elects the own members from their own ranks to decide who dispatches each other. And every year they get to elect new guys, right? Um, and so that means that they get to 
fairly distribute the work. Not only that, they institute a system nicknamed low man out, where how do you decide if 100 guys show up for jobs and there's only 50, who gets those 50 jobs? Well, according to the low man out system, um, when you show up at the dispatch hall, if you show up, because you don't have to actually show up for work if you don't want to, but if you want to get paid, you got to show up for work. Well, those workers who in that quarter of the year have had the least amount of hours work get the first jobs. Low man out. Another way to describe this, if you happen to believe in Christianity, is the last shall be first, right? Um, and so these socialists institute a system that equitably distributes the work. This is incredibly radical, incredibly unusual, and gives you really the best possible sense of what this union um, imagined for itself. Not only was this union committed to socialism, they were also committed to racial equality from the get-go. Now they understood very clearly that the bosses use race and racism to divide and weaker, weaken workers. Therefore, what this union did was instantly guarantee equal treatment of all black people and other people of color in the union. Um, now there were very few blacks in San Francisco or in Oakland for that matter in the 30s. During World War II, a huge increase in blacks um, to the Bay Area, especially to the city of Oakland, occurred because of the huge shortage of workers. Some of those workers ended up working on the waterfront, including the man on the left pictured Cleophus Williams, who only passed away about two years ago. When Cleophus moved from rural Arkansas to Oakland in 1942, he ended up on the waterfront. And in his words, and I became friends with him in his final few years of life, when I came to the waterfront, many black workers, and I should say himself too, considered Local 10 to be a utopia. Cleophus once said to me, it was the first time I had ever met white people who weren't racist. My thoughts always were, well, we don't know what white people are thinking, but we do know what white people are doing, right? In other words, in their actions, they were anti-racist. Now, although they were anti-racist in the out of view, not just in Local 10, which represents barrier workers, Local 10 became, well, Local 10 was the largest um, local, but it was also where the headquarters was and still is, and it was far and away the most radical uh, but it was also the most influential because numerically it was the largest, right? And so um, as a result of this World War II, um, uh, suddenly what was literally 1% local 10 members black by the late 1940s, we're talking closer to 25%. Now after World War II, however, the amount, the demand for work declined because, well, the war was actually good, ironically, for the economy. What do you do? Um, do you cut out the um, newer members, what often is called last hired, first fired? If they did that, they would intentionally be cutting out the African-American members. In a huge meeting that happened in 1948, 1949, the members of Local 10 talked about what they should do, knowing that they were all working less, they were earning less money. Should they kick out some of their members or should they all suffer together? And in a historic vote, they decided, no, we are not going to expel our junior members who disproportionately were black. Instead, we will suffer together. There are few better examples in the history of the United States of America in the commitment of people to racial equality than that. It is an known, unknown story and it is very unusual, um, but it gives you a sense of this union and that's time and place. Now, this union continued to fight among their own union brothers as well as beyond the union because some white members of the union were less open to racial equality than others. And so essentially Local 10 became this battering ram that started to break open union locals that were less open to African-Americans and other people of color. So for instance, Local 34, which was essentially the information gatherers, the clerks. Um, if you ever watch The Wire, you know there's two locals in most courts, right? There's the dock workers, the cargo handlers, and also the clerks. Yeah, um, so thanks to Bill Chester, who was a dock worker originally from Louisiana, but had moved to um, uh, the Bay Area in World War II. He becomes one of the leaders in uh, the 50s and 60s in the LWU. Um, I do want to note that the LWU is far from perfect, right? Um, even uh, institutions committed in theory to race, racial equality and practice fail sometimes. Um, Portland notoriously was um, all white and resistant to including black people. Um, down in LA, Long Beach, Local 13, in fact, did reduce its members after World War II in a way that very clearly and um, targeted black junior members. And often, um, the Harry Bridges, himself so committed to racial equality and loved by the black membership, um, sometimes would use the excuse that locals get to decide their own policies um, instead of pushing harder against some of his own members. Um, 
Despite all these sort of problems, overall, Local 10 and the LW generally was incredibly progressive when it came to racial equality. That's why in the 1940s, Paul Robeson, pictured on the right, was inducted into the LW and was friends with Harry Bridges. Um, the photograph is of actually two black members of the LW with Robeson, um, the man in the center, Martin Luther King, um, visited San Francisco's Local 10 in 1967 in order to basically learn from the IW um, because he understood that interracial unionism was one of the best ways to basically um, attack black poverty um, and was inducted into the IW and Local 10 in 67. Of course, the next year he's murdered and um, actually the dock workers in the Bay Area stopped work that day because there was and still remains a tradition. If a member of the union is killed, then everybody goes home for the next 24 hours, right? And so the Port of Oakland shut down in 1968 when other cities um, uh, sort of blew up. Now I could go on and on and on about Local 10's commitment to anti-racism, but I'm gonna try to transition to other subjects. But I do wanna just say one other point. Um, in the early 60s, when um, the federal government was contributing to the displacement of black urban communities in San Francisco, that included a neighborhood called the Fillmore, um, uh, IW took some of its pension funds and built the first ever privately developed integrated housing that was owned by the people who live there. That's called a worker or housing co-op. It still exists today, um, very close to actually um, uh, what a neighborhood that's now sometimes called Japantown. Um, but St. Francis Square Housing Co-op um, provided a thousand homes to um, black, brown, white, yellow people, working class people, right? Um, and to this day, that's actually a sort of a little beacon of light in an, over, an overwhelmingly unaffordable city. So in Durban, black workers lived in these places called hostels. Um, the uh, black workers didn't have the choice of where to live. They were basically forced to live near the waterfront because once more, the ship must sail on time, right? In South Africa, even before a port apartheid formally existed, um, there was massive racism um, and uh, a white minority controlled the country as it did in neighboring Rhodesia that became Zimbabwe, right? Um, in Durban, most of the workers were from the ethnic group called Zulu, um, which is well known. Um, also, some were called Pando. Um, Pando is another ethnic group. They speak Osa, um, which is in what now is the Eastern Cape. Um, so what we have in Durban is an all black workforce um, who live together, work together, and are largely of the same ethnic group, right? Um, They're also casual, but um, black workers are not allowed to go on strike because, well, White workers had rights that black workers didn't in South Africa. However, black workers technically don't have a job. They only get a job when they're picked for that ship. And so because they were casual, if one person doesn't show up for work, no problem. But if the entire workforce collectively decides the day before, we're not gonna show up for work today or tomorrow, then what you have by all intents and purposes is a strike. And so um, dozens of times, um, collective action on the part of these so-called casual workers very effectively resulted in higher uh, wages, but also power on the part of this all black workforce we're talking about from the late 19th century into the mid 20th century. Um, during World War II, dock workers went on strike a bunch of times. Why should black workers in South Africa care about white people killing each other in Europe anyway? Um, but also um, after World War II, black workers on the waterfront were really arguably the most militant group of workers in the city of Durban, the third largest city in South Africa. Um, and um, again, because Durban is so important to the country of South Africa, um, really important to the entire economy. By the late 1950s, dock workers in Durban had occasionally coordinated their work stoppages with the African National Congress, um, which had a labor union sort of um, arm to it called the South African Congress of Trade Union. You can see their motto on that button on the left, an injury to one is an injury to all, right? Um, dock workers by the late 50s who quote, stay away because legally they cannot strike. And so they use other terms for the same effects. Um, I wanna highlight here that black workers um, are fighting across the continent for liberation. In the 50s, the entire continent are still colonized by European powers, right? Um, and so whether you're talking about um, uh, Portuguese West Africa, Guinea-Bissau in 1959, where dock workers go on strike, or whether we're talking about Durban in 1959, right? It's not insignificant that black transport workers are really important, railroad workers too. So in the late 60s, um, after a massive repression against um, anti-apartheid activists, including um, in Durban, 
um, results in a so-called quiet decade where there's less resistance inside South Africa. Essentially, anyone who was opposed to um, apartheid in South Africa had either been killed, imprisoned, driven underground, um, driven into silence, or went into exile, including the African National Congress and the Pan-African Congress. Um, and so in the mid to late 60s and early 70s was the quietest, the least resistance within the country to apartheid. Durban dock workers play a pivotal role in changing that. In the late 60s, 1969, Durban dockers go on strike, the largest strike for a few years of black workers in the country. In 71, they threaten to, and in 1972, late 1972, just before Christmas break, um, they uh, go on strike again. In early 1973, right after the Christmas break, black workers would go home to their, quote, homelands for two to four weeks during the Christmas time. Might be the only time a year that black male workers would get to see their families and their home places, right? Right after basically um, Christmas, um, early 73, a huge wave of black and Indian workers go on strike in Durban. This becomes known as the Durban strikes. And for those of us who know South African history, um, it's one of the most important moments in the struggle against apartheid. Too often, Durban dockers are ignored in why that happens. In other words, some people say, why did the strikes happen in Durban and not say Johannesburg or Cape Town? Well, the answer is, is because actually the Durban dockers were um, sowing the seeds, if you will, of the activism that then grows some roots and, 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 and flowers in early 73. And although I don't know if he's on this call, um, a friend of mine named David Hemson was actually one of these activists in early 70s Durban, um, who now lives in the DC area. Um, and he was a very important part of that moment. So a whole other theme in my book deals with containerization and how the transition from basically a heavy manual labor job to a job that's highly automated, where these very expensive um, cranes that workers essentially drive um, and lift and load um, thousands of these metal boxes or containers off and onto ships and then onto rail cars or onto semi trucks. Um, this multimodal system called containerization will explode the global economy. It will result in a massive increase in trade um, from the 1960s and 70s. It also will result in the movement of manufacturing from uh, the US and other industrialized countries to lower wage countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, that's of enormous importance. Uh, one third of my book deals with this subject, but one third of my talk will not be tonight. Instead, I'm gonna just tell you, I don't know if this counts as a teaser, I actually explore this important matter in my book, but will not do so tonight. But honestly, in the 21st century, technological change in our workplaces is perhaps the single most important workplace issue there is, right? Um, and containerization is an important component in that. And the ILWU was the first worker uh, maritime union in the world to negotiate the transition to containers in the late 60s, or in the 60s, I should say. Instead, I'm going to devote my last 10 minutes to this subject, um, how dock workers fought not only for black freedom at home, but also fought for black freedom in other countries. People who you've never met before and maybe never will. Will you fight for those people? That's an important question, and it's a lot to ask, you might say. Um, this is sometimes called transnational activism because you're going beyond or transnational in your efforts. So um, quickly, black people who have worked in sh on ships and on waterfronts around the world for the last four or 500 years have developed a long history of activism. Sometimes this is called pan-Africanism, although that's, um, these black workers are a part of a larger tradition, um, but I'm highlighting the man on the left with the pipe, Usman Semben, a Senegalese artist and filmmaker who actually um, was a dock worker in Marseille in, um, after World War II. Um, uh, or Claude McKay, the Jamaican poet on the right, who lived in New York City for much of his adult life and was a legendary novelist and poet, um, uh, the, uh, who had been a, a sailor before he, um, well, was a sailor too, right? Um, and the image on the right, black people protesting the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. Black maritime workers have been central to activism um, in many countries for many decades. I'm gonna highlight a few examples. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, in 1962, um, Bill Chester on the left will coordinate with the white woman pictured in the center of the right, Mary Louise Hooper, um, to pull off the first work stoppage against apartheid in American history. 
right? So um, the woman on the, the right, Hooper, actually had been a friend of Chief Albert Latuli before she was expelled from South Africa for being an activist. She was an American born woman, white woman. Um, she's a leader in um, the US in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, she coordinates with the ILWU basically throughout the small community picket line right, of activists, predominantly black activists, right? Um, and then you can see in this image taken from the Union newspaper from late 1962, all these guys who are basically just sitting around not crossing this picket line. Um, why? Because they've already been told in advance that there was going to be this picket um, and that they were asking these workers to not work to boycott the cargo that was aboard this ship that came from South Africa, right? And so you might call this a strike against apartheid. Now, I do want to highlight one other point. When workers take a job, but don't actually do the work, they don't get paid, right? And so all of these protests that are happening today are amazing. But imagine if you had to pay to attend a protest. What if you had to give up a day's work in order to attend a protest? Would you do that? Probably some of us would not, right? Um, and so I do like to highlight that when these dock workers choose to boycott cargo, they are also choosing to give, take money out of their pockets. Right? And that's uh, an example of the higher level of commitment that a lot of these people had. So in the mid 1970s, Leo Robinson pictured on the right, along with a group of black and white activists, including many pictured on the left, right, form a committee within LW Local 10, the San Francisco Bay Area Local, called the Southern Africa Liberation Support Committee. Why would they do that? Leo and others in the Bay Area some of whom are black, but some of whom are white, and all of whom are left-wing radicals, basically say, we want to support the freedom, the anti-colonial struggles that at that time were in Mozambique, Rhodesia, um, Namibia, and South Africa. Essentially, Southern Africa was the last unfree part of Africa, right? So they did this in a number of ways. One way was that they raised um, food, medicine, and other supplies, and ship them in containers, like in the photograph on the left. Um, the man uh, holding his fist up in the back of the photograph on the left, um, Will, uh, Billy Proctor, um, is uh, holding his son. Um, he later moved up to Seattle, um, and his son is currently a dock worker in Seattle, although the little boy in the photograph. Um, Leo Robinson's pictured with the shades in the center next to him with the afro. Um, most of these men, except for Proctor and Larry Wright, who's the short white guy on the left, um, have passed away, unfortunately. Right? Um, but I interviewed everybody who was involved and still alive by the time I got to them about 10 years ago. So in 1984, right before the election of Ronald Reagan, the landslide re-election, right, um, the committee showed a movie at their um, monthly meeting. That documentary is called Last Grave in Baza, pictured on the left. It's very hard to find, but it's well worth watching. Essentially, it's an hour long documentary made in South Africa in the 70s, smuggled out and used as a tool to educate people why apartheid sucks, right? Um, after watching this film, basically as planned, a member of the committee raised his hand at the local 10 meeting and said, we suggest, we propose that the next ship that comes in with cargo from South Africa get boycotted. Every single person in the room voted in favor. Right? And so a few weeks later, in between, Reagan won in a landslide re-election. Reagan famously was notoriously anti-union. The ship comes in with some cargo from South Africa. When this ship comes in, the workers unload all the other cargo. But after they do that, they announce, and Billy Proctor, the man whose fist was raised in the pre previous photograph, was in the hold of that ship. And he said, all right, guys, we're out of here. And everyone walked off that ship. And then for the next 10 days, no one would touch the cargo on that ship. That became the largest, um, longest, and most impressive and inspirational workplace action against apartheid in US anti-apartheid history. And it inspired many other people in the Bay Area and beyond to become more involved themselves. Six years later, Nelson Mandela was um, freed from prison. The ANC and other political organizations were unbanned. Um, Nelson and his then wife, Winnie, did a victory lap around the world repeatedly. And in 1990, they visited the United States. And their last stop on that tour was Oakland, California, where before 50,000 people at Oakland Coliseum, um, they thanked, uh, Nelson thanked uh, the LW Local 10 for their action of six years prior. Um, he devoted 10% of his speech, in fact, to that. So last subject I'll talk about quickly, 2008, much more recent times, Durban dock workers pull off something similar. In 2008, next door to South Africa is Zimbabwe to the north. Zimbabwe is landlocked. That means it needs to ship all of its stuff in and receive goods um, ship in and out 
through uh, Mozambique, Maputo, or Durban, South Africa. Durban's a much bigger and more important port, and so basically Zimbabwe is dependent upon Durban for a lot of its imports and exports. At that time, Robert Mugabe was still president of uh, Zimbabwe, but a lot of people were, wanted him out. Um, when basically a union leader ran uh, to challenge Mugabe in 2008, he probably beat Mugabe, but then Mugabe basically used the police and the military to kill hundreds, um, beat up thousands, uh, including um, Sangarai, the picture of the presidential challenger, um, as basically the world is watching as uh, Mugabe uses military force to try to um, hold on to power. During that moment, a Chinese ship comes into Durban loaded with weapons and ammunition for the Zimbabwean army. The Durban dock workers refused to unload that ship. This was an incredible act of solidarity. And when I interviewed the leaders of that action in 2010, two years later, I said, why did you do this? Right? And they basically told me in their offices in Durban, first of all, Zimbabwe had helped us in the struggle against apartheid. In other words, we owe them. Secondly, these guns are gonna kill our fellow workers and we are committed to our fellow workers, right? And so basically they exhibited transnational solidarity of a significant sort, saved the lives probably of a bunch of Zimbabweans. Unfortunately, Mugabe did not um, relinquish power and held on to power until near his death just a few years ago. These actions that I've described could be many other places. And so I just wanna highlight one other. Just last year, um, dock workers in multiple ports in Europe, including Marseille uh, and in Italian ports, have refused to load military supplies aboard the Saudi vessel on the, uh, on the upper hand photograph because Saudi Arabia has been conducting a brutal, terrible, deadly war against Yemen, right? That is um, really one of the most horrible crimes of the world today. Um, and that these workers um, refuse to sort of engage in that action is identical, of course, to what um, those Durban dock workers did a um, uh, decade prior. The last thing I'll say, uh, some of us already know this, but last week, uh, the West Coast dock workers and East Coast and Gulf Coast dock workers took off a short time from work on the day that George Floyd's funeral happened. However, as some of us know, this upcoming Friday, which is June 19th, which is also called Juneteenth, um, a, a holiday that we celebrate to, to celebrate the end of slavery in 19, 1865, dock workers on the West Coast have already announced that they are going to stop work across the entire coast from as far south as San Diego all the way up to Bellingham, Washington um, for the entire eight hour day shift, right? Um, this is, in other words, only the latest chapter in an ongoing story right, in which workers demonstrate the power that they have, which is, in a way, the power to stop work, right. And so um, I could talk to you much more, obviously, but I appreciate your attention and your time, and I am going to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to um, hopefully successfully stop sharing my screen so that we can now have a conversation about these subjects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, we do have uh, a few questions here already in the thread. Uh, feel free, uh, anyone else who has a, a question after all this, to, to put yours in there. Uh, but I will start off with the first one uh, from Larry Marks, uh, who is wondering uh, to what extent the progressive culture in the San Francisco Bay Area is a result of the progressive thinking of the ILWU, uh, or to what extent was the ILWU's culture affected by the progressive worldview in San Francisco? What's the relationship there? So that's a great question. And of course, it's mutually reinforcing, but I would say it's really the first, right? I mean, you got to think about San Francisco as this um, port city, right? And so people are coming in, sailors, right? What are they going to do, right? Well, first of all, sailors are coming from all over the world. Right? Like uh, it's a diverse lot, right? That's the nature of the industry, right? Um, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to sort of talk to each other, right? They're going to exchange ideas. They're going to uh, exchange information about what's happening, right? And really, it is because of the, the maritime culture, which of course also exists in some other cities, that San Francisco becomes very open. Now, I also want to highlight sexual openness, right? Because guess what those sailors are going to do as, as soon as they get off the ship? Now, some of them are going to have sex with women, but some of them, of course, have been spending months aboard a ship, all male, they're already comfortable having sex with people of the same sex, right? Mm -hmm. like, uh, and guess where that is? North Beach, right? All right. North Beach becomes the place where the beats hang out. 
right? Um, after World War II, that's not coincidence. The Beats basically moved into a place that was a progressive working class neighborhood, right? And then what happens? Well, more progressives move into North Beach, like say the hippies, right? Like, uh, and so it, it reinforces itself over time. And that's why I use the example of Hamburg, because you have similar things happening in other cities. I could go to Cape Town and see something similar. Right now, of course, it's not only the port, right? Like, I mean, I don't want to sort of push this too far. Um, but if I had to give a single reason why San Francisco is the tolerant, which is, of course, not necessarily inclusive, tolerance better than nothing, but like, I mean, tolerant is a start, right? Why is San Francisco so tolerant? I'd say the number one reason is that, right? Like, uh, of course, uh, there is other factors too, but I appreciate the question. Great. We, we have another kind of uh, a comment on that, uh, which is sort of the, the role of uh, the Chinese uh, in San Francisco, uh, who are, of course, part of the gold rush in the early days of California, um, and then eventually kind of moved into Chinatown in San Francisco as they were forced out of those areas. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the role of the Chinese uh, uh, in the, the dock workers union or in, in San Francisco as a city? or in Dermot as a city. <laughs> I'm happy to do that um, to some extent. So a huge number of Chinese live in San Francisco in the mid 1800s, um, basically brought to the United States to um, not to work in the mines, but actually to work to build the railroads, right? Like, uh, so um, in the 1860s and beyond, um, thousands of Chinese men are brought in on essentially indentured servants um, and do the heavy work, and I should note thousands died, building the Transcontinental Railroad, right? Um, a lot of those guys also ended up working in mining subsequently um, after the, essentially the railroads were built, right? Like, uh, and San Francisco was the biggest port. It was really the only major port on the West Coast at that time. And so um, all immigrants in the same way that New York City, Ellis Island, uh, San Francisco was the gateway for immigrants from Asia right, into San Francisco. Not just Asia, but also that's why Harry Bridges from Australia ended up in San Francisco, right, in 1922. Um, so um, the Chinese are there. They're hated. They're hated, they're hated, they're hated. Why? Well, white people already had developed a sense of white supremacy. Um, and although there were two African Americans in the West in the mid-1800s, the um, similar prejudices were applied to essentially the large non-white population that people hated and or feared. Right. Um, and so that's why really it's really the Chinese Exclusion Act that the U.S. Congress passes in 1882 is really being pushed by Californians. Right. Um, because there's very few Chinese people anywhere else in that time. Right. Like, uh, and so it's really the um, uh, that's a white working class, you might say, that's pushing. Right. Um, uh, although it's also nurtured by white elites. Right. Um, you have a cross class white alliance that's really anti Chinese. It's not unique to China, uh, to San Francisco. It's really up and down the West Coast and in the interior West too, right? Like in the mid 1880s in Wyoming, right? Like in a place called what, um, God, I'm blanking on the name, but like a dozen Chinese were murdered, right? Um, in a railroad town in Southwest Wyoming in 1885, right? Like, uh, and so um, very few Chinese work on the waterfront, right? Um, it's actually 99% people of different European um, Americans and European immigrants. Um, but there is a Chinese community. The last thing I'll say about that is that um, when the Japanese invade China, right, 1931, and then expand their invasion in 1937, right, the Chinese community of, of, of San Francisco is opposed to the Japanese invasion. ILW members in Local 10 refused to load cargo aboard a, a ship intended for Japan. At that time, we have normal relations. Japan is already fascist, right? Like, uh, and so, although I haven't done much research on it, it's actually the first example of the IW refusing to work cargo for political reasons, right? It's actually on solidarity with China, right? And so it gives us a little flavor, right, that this union, which at that time was literally 99% white, was willing, at least occasionally, um, to engage in solidarity action, not just with um, people in the United States, but also actually with, um, uh, well, at that time, our China was an ally of sorts. Um, but uh, Japan, we still had normal relations with, and it was five years, uh, four years before Pearl Harbor, right? Um, and so it's a very interesting example of um, a transnational action um, on behalf of Chinese, which would have been very unusual. And the only other thing I'll say about that is that um, 1942, when the United States government interns 125,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans, the IOW is one of the few institutions in America that takes a public stand against, right? Um, 
it didn't prevent the internment, um, but it was a sort of a uh, speaking truth to power in a moment that subsequently is seen as lies, but at the time was really the voice crying out in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of action today? Uh, I know, you know China obviously dominates a lot of the manufacturing and a lot of the goods that are being sent back and forth in these containers at a, a lot of these ports. Um, is there a lot of action today within the unions or the dock workers uh, against Chinese politics at this point in time? Uh, are they too powerful because of the amount of shipping they do? What's, what's the, uh, the situation today? Well, that's a great and long and complicated matter. Um, I would say two things, maybe one, um, because that ship must sail on time and now the industry is often called logistics, right? Like uh, um, LA Long Beach has long surpassed the barrier in terms of um, the volume of, port of cargo. Um, one of the reasons is that Southern California is closer to China than Northern California, right? Like. Uh, um, and Seattle Tacoma is actually closer to Japan, right? If you think about the North Atlantic, right? Like, uh, and so um, that's really what makes, that's what the charts that these sort of logistics people are doing when they're thinking about how fast can I move these things, right? Um, so a second component is that, um, you know, dock workers are part of an international transport worker federation. It goes back actually to the 19th century. And so historically less so, but in, in the last generation or so, there's a lot of communication among dock workers and their unions in this federation, right? They all have separate contracts often um, uh, in terms of waterfront, but they often coordinate together, um, including especially in the barrier to the Japanese dock workers. There's a lot of intentional efforts to try to get to know each other and they, so they send delegations, right? A third and final thing I'll say, which is really sort of maybe the heart of your question is, so if there's more free trade, that would probably be good for dock workers because more cargo equals more work, right? However, um, the LWU, uh, going back to the 1990s, was opposed to the passage of NAFTA. And in 1999, opposed to the World Trade Organization um, meetings that were being held in Seattle. And so they actually shut down the entire West Coast to protest the WTO meetings um, then in Seattle in the fall of 1999. Um, because even though that would, benefit them materially, they think that these agreements are often only to the benefit of corporations and often hurt other working people. Um, and so they've taken a stand that would arguably be bad for their pocketbooks, right? Um, uh, that's, a, again, a complicated issue, but the IW has actually taken clear stands against these so-called free trade agreements of different sorts. And I mention that in this context because China is, as you mentioned, is the number one exporter of goods to the U.S. Right. Um, or to say it another way, we are the, our, our largest import is from China. Right. Like, uh, and so obviously that doesn't prevent it. And really, L.A. Long Beach, um, there is a lot of work in the port of L.A. Long Beach because um, it is the primary recipient of Chinese cargo. Right. Um, and that remains the case to this day. Mm -hmm. We had a, another comment or question um, from Larry Marks. Um, about the containerization and the reduction um, in the workforce in general as a result of, you know, upgrades in technology. Is this diluting the power of the Dock Workers Union? Is it diluting the progressivism at all? So those are wonderfully important questions. And I devote several chapters of my book to them. When I started my research, I was really interested in the fact that Local 10 specifically was so progressive in terms of its racial politics. But as I was doing research, I kept on running into this issue and decided that it was too important and interesting for me to ignore. And so subsequently, a third of my book speaks to some of the question issues that the questioner asked. Um, so to try to be quick, everyone <laughs> understood that if you introduce a radical new technology that will radically increase productivity, that will radically reduce the number of workers. This is no secret. Right. This goes back, of course, to the early 1800s when English textile owners introduced um, essentially more sophisticated looms that would increase productivity and famously English textile workers destroyed their looms, not because they were anti-technology, just because they were not going to get any of the benefits of those technologies. Right? Um, and those people became known as the Luddites, and that term has falsely been associated with people who are anti-technology. In my opinion, it should be understood as we're not anti-technology, 
we're just wanting a jump, right? Like, uh, so what is, who benefits from this introduction of a new technology? That's crucial. Now, these guys understood this in the late 50s and early 60s, Harry Bridges and others in the IWU, when they negotiated what became known as the Mechanization and Modernization Agreement, M&M, in 1960 and 66, right? And so what they did, which was, let me first say, ask yourself, if you operate, if you have a job, does your boss ever ask you your opinion before introducing a new technology? The answer is almost never, right? Um, and so... This union was so powerful that the, the shipping corporations basically negotiated it. That already tells us that they understood that they, didn't, they couldn't do it themselves, right? Um, then what they did, basically what the union had this long sort of uh, conversation over multiple years, but ultimately um, Bridges convinced the membership that it would be in their best interest to accept a deal, but to extract significant concessions. One of the most important concessions was not a single person would get fired. Right, um, and so they guaranteed that a single worker in the current generation would be fired. Of course, if you're voting on the contract, that might be good enough for you. Down the road, what you might think of as the sons and now daughters of these workers, there's gonna be fewer jobs, right? That was understood, but well, they're gonna sort of delay the pain, which is incredible actually, especially if you compare it to almost any other industry in the transition technologically. Two, we want a major part of the productivity games, what they call the share of the machine. And so they basically got a bunch of money from the um, companies and they did several things with them. One, they shrunk from the top. So they basically um, took the money, some of it, and they convinced older workers who didn't need much convincing to retire early, right? Um, rather than firing the young, they basically bought out the old. Right, um, and so they were able to reduce numbers early on, not through firings, but essentially through convincing people who weren't needed much convincing that, well, you could uh, sort of, here's a bunch of money and enjoy retirement, right? Like, uh, so shrink from the top, right? Um, another thing they did was, we also want major wage gains. We want health insurance, we want dental insurance, the LWU will actually, dock workers will make much more money. Historically, they made decent money in the 50s and 60s, but by the 70s and 80s, there were fewer workers, but those who worked and got enough hours, right, actually suddenly were making more, as I've joked many times, than many professors, right? Like, uh, and so, you know, the transition was, now the last thing I'll say about that, although obviously I could speak further, right, like, uh, is that would that result, if you have more money, you might say you have less, more to lose. Do you become more conservative? Right now there, you can understand the logic. Also, as we age, some of us become more conservative, although not all, right? Well, do these, does this unit become more conservative, right? Um, the answer is yes and no, right? Like, uh, but they continue to engage in commitment to anti-racism and other sorts of um, radical equality initiatives that suggest that even though they are, those who are members are comfortable financially, generally, they're still willing actually to put their work on the line and they're still willing to fight on behalf of others who are less fortunate. That's really the inheritance of the early generations who bestowed, if you will, upon the current generation of dock workers, um, that sort of commitment to justice and equality, right? Like uh, um, I have a tendency perhaps to sort of uh, glorify this union because I'm so deeply impressed by um, its history and its membership. Um, but I think if we compare them to many other workers, union and non-union, we can understand, I hope, why I, I feel that way. Great. Uh, Danny has a question, uh, elo eloquent as always. Uh, Danny, do you want to hop on and, and relay your own question in your inimitable style or, or should I read it for you? <laughs> Go ahead, Lorena. Okay, uh, Danny asks, um, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, you mentioned South African labor solidarity with Zimbabwe. Your interlocutors said they felt indebted to Zimbabwe, which had supported the struggle against apartheid. But Mugabe often invoked that history in his own defense that he had led the regional struggle against apartheid. As the labor activist and pan-Africanist Bill Fletcher has pointed out, Mugabe's reputation as an anti-colonial leader and an opponent of apartheid made it difficult for many of his admirers around the world to make sense of Mugabe's brutal repression against Zimbabwean opposition and labor activists, leading to considerable confusion and debate. But the South African labor activists you interviewed saw beyond this and stood not with Mugabe, but with their fellow trade unionists in Zimbabwe. 
Were there debates or controversies about this in South Africa and how did this play out? Well, that's a great question and I appreciate the knowledge um, that Danny shared. So even going back into the 1980s, right, and 1990s as in the post Mugabe era, more of us are appreciating, although some of us did before his demise, um, that he, there are some early signs of tells, right, of uh, authoritarianism on the part of Mugabe. In particular, uh, some mass killings of uh, the second, uh, essentially the second largest ethnic group in Zimbabwe um, in the 80s, right? Um, uh, the largest ethnic group is the Shona, Mugabe Shona, um, but uh, the Indembele was uh, essentially very close to the Zulus, right, ethnically and linguistically, and um, essentially Mugabe squashed resistance in order to consolidate power, right? Simultaneously, he's giving safe harbor to the ANC and other um, South African exiles in the 80s, and he is, in fact, uh, an ally of the uh, anti-apartheid movement. It's undeniable, right? Like, uh, um, fast forward to the 21st century, right? The early 21st century. After Mandela, the president is Thabo Mbeki. Thabo Mbeki, who had gone into exile and was the leaders of the ANC in exile, right? And was close with Mugabe. Right. And so uh, Mbeki was constantly saying in, say, 2004, 5, 6, we are engaging in quiet diplomacy. Right. Um, in other words, I know that Mugabe is not treating maybe his people right and there's a lot of suffering, but we're going to engage in what Bill Clinton might call constructive engagement. Right. Like uh, um, there was a lot of resistance within South Africa to that. And I should also note that there are several million Zimbabweans who fled Zimbabwe for South Africa, including in Durban, but also especially in the Johannesburg area, to spend time in South Africa is to meet people from Zimbabwe. It's sort of like in the United States, to spend time in the United States is to meet Mexicans and Mexican Americans, right? There is a long cultural, demographic, economic, linguistic, um, geographic connections between these two countries that were artificially divided by the English, right? So like what we've got is, Mbeki is in favor of continuing to engage with Zimbabwe, but the labor movement, which is part of something called the Co Congress of South African Trade Unions, COSATU, which is officially part of the ruling coalition as a junior partner in this triple alliance, is also therefore supporting M Mbeki. However, here you have a member union that's essentially going against the Federation and Mbeki in this quiet diplomacy rejecting quiet diplomacy. And there's actually an image I show in my slide of a political cartoon from the moment where um, basically some dock workers give the middle finger to that ship um, that sails away back to China. And he says, this is what we think of quiet diplomacy, right? And so internally in South Africa, there is a debate going on. And as Danny may also know, Mbeki will fall, right? Mbeki will lose um, an important vote at an ANC Congress, right, in 2007, resulting in the rise of Jacob Zuma which at that time, the labor movement actually thought was going to be for their benefit, right? Uh, that's ironic because Jacob Zuma, who became the president for two terms, ended up being a horrible president, um, worse than Mbeki, and worse for the labor movement too, right? And really for working South Africans, right? Um, but you couldn't have known that in 2007 and 8, right? Um, when basically uh, Kosatu took away its support from Mbeki and threw it, along with other groups, to Zuma. Right at a place called Polokwane, which was where the ANC was meeting. Right, like, a, and so there's some really interesting history here. It's also interesting because the the formal labor movement has more political influence in South Africa, albeit limited, than you might say the AFL CIO does here in the United States. It's not like really the main political parties want to consult with AFL CIO. I mean, Trump doesn't, but the Democrats really take for granted AFL CIO also. Um, and so um, Kosatu weak as it may be, actually has some strength within the South African political system. Um, and this sort of resistance to Mbeki's quiet diplomacy is sort of an example of how Mbeki was about to fall, right, um, politically speaking. Great, thank you. Um, I personally took a note at the very beginning of your lecture. I, I don't know if you were hoping we weren't paying attention to that, but uh, you said that you would be happy to go into uh, further comparisons between the U.S. and uh, South Africa today, as uh, Robert Kennedy did uh, during his visit. So uh, I would be very interested personally in, in hearing your thoughts on that. Of course, you should take my class. Um, <laughs> like, uh, you know, both are um, populations of indigenous peoples right, that suffer from imperialism in the 1600s, right? Like uh, literally the Dutch move into 
New Amsterdam, which then the British take and rename New York. The Dutch move into Cape Town in the Western Cape in the same generation, the, the early mid 1600s. And then it took a bit longer, but the British basically took um, the, the Dutch possessions from the Dutch because the British were a rising empire and the Dutch were a falling empire in the early 1800s, right? Why did the British want that? Is uh, In both cases, it's because of uh, financial gain and strategic benefits of controlling these regions of the world, right? Like, uh, uh, then of course you have the um, decimation of indigenous peoples, less so in South Africa because numerically um, there are difference, although um, the Dutch and later the British moved some people, therefore it's called a settler colony. The United States becomes, is basically a product of settler colonialism too, the British being the largest that move people. Most British colonies were not places where British people moved to, right? Only Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the US, Kenya a little, South Africa a little, are settler colonies, right? Like uh, um, most British possessions weren't settler colonies, right? Like uh, um, then you've got basically um, the sort of uh, enslavement, right, of black people in both places, Right, then you have over time a resistance to enslavement on the part of the enslaved as, uh, and more broadly uh, people of color, right? Um, then you've got, of course, the sort of conquest of the frontier, um, basically the destruction of native peoples in the mid 19th century in the interior of what now is South Africa, so too in the mid late 19th century in the interior west, right? Um, there's more parallels. Um, it is also important to note the differences, right? Like, uh, so the most important difference is demographic. Um, in the United States of America, we still have a white majority, right? Like uh, in South Africa, there's never been a white majority, right? Like at its largest, maybe um, in the around 1900, maybe 15 to 20% of people who live in what is South Africa were of European descent, um, meaning that 80% were um, people of color, right? The last thing I'll say as far as similarities is the diversity. It's not just black and white. Right. In South Africa, you have nine major linguistic groups. Today in South Africa, there are 11 official languages. Two are European, English and Afrikaans, which is basically a, a Dutch, right? And then nine native languages, um, including uh, Kwazulu uh, or um, uh, Isi, Zulu, um, Soto, Swana, um, um, uh, others, right? Like, uh, um, and in, um, and also a lot of Indians. The British brought in 150,000 South Asians to basically work as quasi-slaves on sugar plantations in, in Natal, right? And so yeah, you've got basically, and then you have mixed race people who become a separate legal category. No longer it's a legal category, but now it's sort of a complicated cultural category called coloreds. As an example of that for an American listener, Barack Obama, right? Like a black, Mother, black father, white mother, colored. You're in a separate legal category. In America, we're not as sophisticated or complicated. We just have two. If you're not white, you're black, right? And so black, Barack Obama becomes black because he's not white, right? Um, uh, so it's different significantly in that way. Um, but actually it also shows this sort of rich tapestry, you could say, of ethnic and racial groups. Um, and then the last point, of course, is this incredible inspirational struggle against apartheid and racism. Uh, in the same way that many non-black people are inspired by and want to give support to the civil rights movement or the black equality movement in the USA, right? So to um, the anti-apartheid movement um, is this incredible social movement for freedom that's partially successful, if not resulting in total equality in South Africa today. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I've had uh, bad allergies lately, so I apologize. Um, I think that's that's the end of the questions we have in the chat. Unless anyone wants to to toss in there, Danny, did you have any any closing remarks this evening? Thanks, Lorena. I was actually okay, and it looks like we have a chat. Okay, that was just a nice comment from Larry Mark saying that this has been wonderful. I should note. I don't know if you've been looking at the chat, Peter, but there have been multiple such comments expressing that sentiment. I was about to type up a question. But because my questions tend to be so long, I didn't get around to finishing it. Um, so I'll just go ahead and ask you, Peter. Um, you know, as someone who spent a very long time, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, you, you founded and coordinated a, a, an initiative 
um, called the Chicago Race Riot of 1919 Commemoration Project, which tried to, you know, remind the city of Chicago uh, about this horrific episode in our own history um, and its continuing legacy. So given that, and given your work more generally in sort of public history, um, what are your, do you have any thoughts on, on the recent discussions of the Tulsa race riot or race massacre of 1921, which is now back in the news and the cultural conversation and more broadly, this sort of moment that we face um, uh, together uh, collectively, Peter? Well, thank you for the opportunity, Danny, to plug this. So my partner on this uh, project, Franklin Cozy Gay, is on this uh, too, right? Like, so um, last summer was the 100th anniversary of the Chicago Race Ride of 1919, um, when a black child was swimming in Lake Michigan because it was really hot out with his black friends, and a white guy on the beach started throwing rocks at these children um, because they had crossed over an invisible line in um, Lake Michigan uh, into a so-called white part of the lake and was murdered, right? Like, and as tensions already existed and they flared in the aftermath of the killing of Eugene Williams, um, that night white gangs from a neighborhood called Bridgeport, which some of us will know, um, essentially invaded the so-called Black Belt, which now, but then was not called Bronzeville, but now would be called Bronzeville, right? Setting off this, um, a week of violence that left 38 people dead, over 500 injured, um, and, um, and then was promptly forgotten, right? Like, uh, as were many of these moments of racial massacres, Tulsa being really numerically in terms of death two years later, greater. Um, we believe, Franklin and I, that like the absence from a, a sort of public memory of the Chicago race ride of 1919 is, is an example of the major historical amnesia that white Americans have perpetrated upon the United States um, and that the failure to essentially reconcile with the past um, is one of the reasons we continue to have racial unrest today. Right. Um, and to sort of throw another sort of uh, issue into the mix, if we look at Germany in the aftermath of the Holocaust, um, that not right after World War II, but by the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of Germans were starting to basically embrace and accept a reckoning with the Holocaust, including an artist named Gutter Demnig, who started to install small brass plaques outside of the last known residences of Holocaust victims. And these are called Stoppersteine in German, or in English, stumbling stones. So you're walking down the streets of Berlin, you come across one or a group of these small brass plaques and bledded into the ground, and you're reminded of that moment of the history of the Holocaust, that it happened right here, and that you might be therefore sort of provoked into thinking about subjects that you may not want to, right? And we would like to believe that if we had a dispersed public art project in the streets of Chicago, locating markers at the 30, for the 38 people killed in 1919, perhaps, in the same way that Stoppersteine have increased conversations about difficult subjects in Germany and across Europe, perhaps in our city, Chicago, we could also engage in conversations that we essentially have chosen to not have, right, for 100 years, right? Um, we are not the only city that's suffering from these problems, and so Tulsa is apt, seeing that um, our president has chosen to go to Tulsa in a few days in order to speak, uh, well, for a campaign rally, but at a place where approximately 300 black people were murdered by white Tulsans in 1921. That is um, shocking that it's happening also on Juneteenth, which is of course this unofficial holiday that black people celebrate in the US to celebrate the end of slavery in 1865, right? Um, that these workers in the Bay Area, but up and down the West Coast are stopping work on Juneteenth. Um, that was actually organized prior to Trump's announcement that he would go to Tulsa on that day. Um, but it's all the more appropriate to perhaps um, raise up a voice to speak to this issue in this place in this time, right? Um, and well, as Franklin and I know, Tulsa is in the midst of planning for a centennial celebrations next year, right? Um, essentially Memorial Weekend, Day Weekend 19, uh, 2021, which there's a chance that we'll be to um, attend. But, um, you know, in our moment right now, Franklin and I have a draft of an op-ed in which we're calling upon our mayor to sort of basically um, jump on board. We've had conversations with some people in the mayor's office about our idea, um, but we want them to basically say, boom, 
like, uh, yeah, we're going to turn this idea into um, a reality because what better time than now to actually sort of actually last summer would have been the right time, the centennial, um, but now is the next best time, right? Like uh, to sort of uh, sort of go get on board, right? Um, you know, uh, I don't blame Warren Lightfoot for sort of a hundred years of historical amnesia, far from it, right? Um, it's wonderful that a black woman is mayor, right? Um, she's the right person in the right moment to sort of do something I don't think it's radical, um, but to sort of call out the city's racism, right? Um, and why is the city as segregated as it is still to this day? Guess what happened in the 20s? A massive increase in residential segregation through policies, including restrictive covenants. And so we say, Franklin and I, that 1919 is sort of an origin story for segregation in Chicago. And um, people know it's segregated, people don't know why, right? Like, uh, well, let's have these conversations, right? Um, and so we hope and believe that our public art, in the same way that George Floyd is inspiring murals in Minneapolis and all these other places, we believe that public art can be an important part of a conversation that is far too long and not being had. So um, I appreciate, Danny, the opportunity to sort of talk to a group of people not planning to hear about this subject, um, but it is relevant and it is connected and it's all the same in my little head. Thank well, you, that sounds great. <laughs> It brings to mind uh, the famous Faulkner line about the past not being dead. In fact, it's not even past. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, Peter, for this uh, tour de force of labor history, um, international history, um, this really stimulating discussion about the meaning of solidarity and activism across borders. Um, and, uh, and especially your concluding thoughts on the legacy of, uh, of racial politics uh, for the present moment uh, that we're experiencing right now. Um, I wanna thank you for this great presentation. I wanna thank everyone who Zoomed in, um, those of you who, who listened uh, and those of you who asked questions, made comments. And, and I wanna thank finally, uh, Lorena Neal and the Evanston Public Library for their partnership on this event and also the co-sponsorship of the Program of African Studies and the Chabria Center for Historical Studies at Northwestern. And Lorena, I should also thank you personally for uh, moderating as always in your characteristically deft way. So thank you for doing that, Lorena. And thanks to everyone for Zooming in tonight. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, this has been recorded and it will be made uh, available soon, I believe, probably through the, um, the Northwestern event page and probably other places. We'll make sure to get a, a link up at, uh, at Evanston Public Library as well. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. One last point. Do buy Peter's book. And if you do, <laughs> please buy it from an independent bookseller. Um, I personally have plugged, as you heard earlier, uh, Bookends and Beginnings because they're local in downtown Evanston. They've partnered with us at the Evanston Public Library on many events, but just buy the book from whichever bookseller you prefer, but make it an independent bookseller. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Adios. Thank you. And I did get one question asking whether the library would acquire a copy. We are working on that and we will. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Good night. Good night, everybody.